Ooh. Whoa. There you go. Shoot. Shoot. Awesome. I think he's gonna. No, he's not gonna. Hello. Test, test one, two. Awesome. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. So, thank you. Um, hello, um, this is Ronaldo, I'm Palco, and we're gonna talk about uh, things with Bluetooth. We tried to spice things up with uh, some GIFs in the animation, and you've seen a Bluetooth lock that uh, has a little mind of its own, and then on the top right you see what's happening if your IoT device doesn't open the lock. You have to get some tools to it. Uh, so uh, the presentation is also available online, uh, so you can later look at it, and also as a PDF, so no need to take notes. Um, Ronaldo, you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Um, hi, I'm Ronaldo, Android developer at Sensorberg. Also very enthusiastic with Pi. I have quite a few at home, plus a few, almost 1,000 at work. Uh, experts diaper changes since two years, and you can find me on Twitter or GitHub. And Falco? I'm Falco. I'm kind of a full stack tinker now, officially CPO at Sensorberg, so I take care of the product, and we also count hardware into it. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter and uh, other stuff. And I have a background in iOS and Android development, so. Uh, some of the code you see running today was actually from me. All right, uh, I'll leave this running, but um, uh, just in the background. So it's all right, leave it like this. So we at Sensorberg, um, we want to uh, enable spaces so people can interact with them. And one of the first things you, you will need to do is, is to get into the building or get into the room from A to B. So that's the first thing we did is access control. Uh, and of course, we did it uh, with a phone, so you can use your, your Android phone um, uh, to, to open doors or other things. Um, and really, the, the, like Bluetooth LE is the only common denominator to transfer data from your phone to something in the wall. Um, like, if you, we want to be offline capable. Um, and also cross-platform, uh, um, so that's what we choose to. We've been doing Bluetooth for the last four years with beacons, so it naturally came to us, of course, we need to do Bluetooth in this as well. Um, what you can currently do with our system is book meeting rooms, open lockers, uh, open the entrance, uh, open garage doors. So the big keychain you have on your, on your belt, you can forget about it, use everything with your phone. Here we go. Um, so in order to get Bluetooth to the door, we uh, needed a device that has Bluetooth low energy, internet, and can actually drive some hardware. So we came up with this. Um, you can put it next to the door, it has a nice clip, uh, a nice cover. Um, it's completely based on the Pi Compute platform. Uh, it's 100% made in Berlin board, so we, we did everything in Berlin. And uh, it's all based on open source software and hardware. So um, we're really uh, proud to, to be part of the open source ecosystem. Everything we do is based on, 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 on open standards, Linux, uh, um, the Raspberry Pi. It's, uh, really, it's really great fun to, to kind of be able to, to evolve this fast in the IoT space when using these kinds of tools. All right, um, who of you has never heard anything about Bluetooth Low Energy. Please raise your hands. That's great. Uh, in case you didn't, just the very basics. Uh, we're not going to cover it here, but uh, the, the GUT, uh, the generic attribute protocol, uh, you kind of need to know about this. It's a hierarchical structure, services and characteristics. characteristics. You can write to them. Uh, you can read them, subscribe to them. Everything has a UUID. There are some standards on Bluetooth.com, but you can also make up your own. Um, so we figured, how do we have a, like a universal communication having uh, from our phone to this gateway? 
And we're using a serial port over BLE. It's a standard kind of invented by Nordic, the chip manufacturer of basically most of the Bluetooth chips you kind of find in the, in the world, at least in the line of Tinker world. Um, and you can find the link there. Um, it has a send and receive um, channel basically, so you can do a request and get a response. And from there, as all you guys know, you can do whatever you want. You can do multiple requests. Uh, so that's what we did. And in order to open something or interact as fast as possible, you always need to do these steps that are highlighted there. Find the device, connect, discover services, um, subscribe to the um, receiving channel, write to the right uh, transmitting channel, and then wait for your answer. Uh, and then, of course, disconnect. And this has kind of been our challenge uh, over the last uh, year to optimize this. So the, the challenge, uh, especially at Sensorberg, and we've kind of taken access control as the start because their speed is key. Uh, imagine every, every door you go to, if you waste time, uh, that adds up to quite some lifetime. So um, we've been collecting and, and doing 400 some thousand Bluetooth connects uh, on, on both platforms. And uh, the goal was to be uh, sub, sub two seconds for the whole round trip. So tap, and after two seconds, latest, the door is open. All right. So uh, I'll get into the needy details, uh, small details on Android. How do we Bluetooth LE? And where are the gotchas? There are lots of them. Um, so you start with us. Well, if you ever interact with any hardware on Android, it's usually the same. You get a system service. You put some characteristics, some parameters you want to uh, know about. Pass some callback. You're going to be receiving. It works for the compass, for the localization. And Bluetooth is not so different. You get statically, weirdly enough, uh, uh, LE scanner on your start stop. Actually, don't use start stop. Use some proper. We have view mode now, much better. Um, you're gonna scan for devices and stop it. Some callback there with some option of filtering for scan. They're very great, very powerful way to minimize battery usage. Um, and then your callback object, it's there here. You have your beautiful scan. So for every time something gets picked up on scan, you're gonna receive with the signal strength. What's the device, MAC address, and uh, from the GAT characteristics that Falco described a second ago, which are the services present on that device. So we can find out, I want to find our doors and not going to find someone else's headphone or any other, a beacon or whatever it could be. So you can nice filter. So from that callback, you just remember them who is nearby, compare with our backend as a call, which are our scanners, can show the UI. Um, so nice and easy, uh, 20 minutes job, you're done with scanning. Uh, and then to communicate back using the serial protocol, uh, whenever it's the right device you want to connect to, again, compare with backend if the right stuff, you just call connect with another set of callbacks. And, and then you're going to receive a connected. First of all, and then you have to discover the service as shown on that previous slide. Whenever they get discovered, you say, please, I would like to um, uh, open door. There's another comment I didn't put on the slide. That's the uh, subscribe that we mentioned earlier. I'll say, please, open door right back to the remote device. And then I say, OK, finish writing. So please, now I'm going to read back and say, there you go, door open, success. and. So like, I don't even know why we took so long. If it's just that, it's an afternoon job. You, you, you're done with your code, can go have a holidays. And then when you're done, you disconnect. And we want to do this under two seconds. So everything is really better with Bluetooth, right? No, it's not. It does not work like that at all. Um, so let's see the reality. Uh, first of all, there is, before Lollipop, you have to handle the different callback, the different API execution. Um, the settings parameters, we have uh, filtering and have use aggressive mode and other. Some devices can handle it, some devices can't. There is no like API for you to query if the device can or not. You kind of guess, no-ish. 
The scan filters, some doesn't support as well. And uh, scan filters are great because allow you to uh, put the limiting on who you, you receiving information back directly on the Bluetooth driver, and that's very, very battery efficient. It's never going to call your Java stack. It's going to stay on its own little process there. But unfortunately, only some devices do, and some devices report that they work with, but it doesn't. You put filters, and you're never going to receive callback. And there is, again, you know, we all know how Android works, all different manufacturers going on, and well, that's it. Deal with it. You're a developer. Uh, so workarounds here. First of all, Nordic uh, semiconductors, they do really a lot of great stuff on the Bluetooth, and they have a whole compact version for the scanning, handle previous API, Lollipop API, and then change again a Nougat change then on Oreo with some uh, Bluetooth 5 features. Uh, so they do a baseline on that, and even do for software the same uh, filtering that they had on hardware. So it's a good start to never use directly the platform version. Uh, yeah, disable the hardware filtering completely, even though they're a great feature if, if I can't count on them. Well, sorry, I really wanted to save the battery, but uh, on the callback for it, so it's that guy we saw a second ago. On some devices, you're going to receive on every single scan. So, for example, this guy here has two Bluetooth chips inside, and it's broadcasting every half second. So in 10 seconds, you should receive at least 20 scans. Uh, on some devices, you're going to get the first time the MAC address of the device is picked, and then you never receive again, ever. So like if you're trying to get the variations of the signal intensity to see how close you are from one place to the other, as we saw, we're using those workspace scenarios. So building scenario, you have a door here and the other one here, and the user is walking by. It's like the, the signal strength change. I have to know that's the nearest door now to open. Well, yeah, deal with it. <laughs> uh, so work around for that is, is very hacky, unfortunately. But yeah, you're going to call start and stop scan on every second, every you, you trigger tweak the values and see where, where you're going to get the best resolution. Um, and this start and stop is not very great for battery. As well. Every time you have to do start and stop, it has a little extra weird heat that we shouldn't have if you're just scanning forever. So uh, Google, starting on Nougat, developer view 4, they say, no, you cannot uh, be uh, start and stop anymore all the time. And for, for on, on the driver implementation is very much fixed on Nougat and onwards. Uh, if you compare to I don't know, the Nexus 4 or something on KitKat, for sure it's working better. You can quite more rely on your start and run. And so they're blocking it to say, now you're going to have to be good citizens, developers, and just do one start whenever you need and go until the end. But this behavior changes, you know, the posts whenever there's developer preview changes on platform and etc. The source for this quote here is web archives, because it got removed from the website and never made to the final one. So you're there doing your code. Oh, it's working great on my marshmallow device. You open this other one. Hmm, what happened is, yeah, there. You can go to the web archives, or of course, it's open source. You can just check on the source code. It's written there on the comment. Um, so, what else do you have for scanning callback? Oh, yeah, you have the scan fail. Of course, something went down with the driver, hardware lab, and you just received those. There are a couple of other fails that's pretty straightforward. It's like um, Bluetooth is not turned on, and you can only start once, so you just code it correctly, your thing, or check with Bluetooth before. But some is just like, well, it failed. You have no further information besides it fail. And the great workaround on that one is that. Yeah, there is, we have quite a few devices on the company, test on different ones, every type possible. If I start and stop again, if I try to start in a new process, or nope, turn off the Bluetooth, turn on again, most devices are going to work. Some have to turn off the whole device. And so, you, you can programmatically turn on and off Bluetooth uh, without special permissions, basically. Yeah, on, it's just a Bluetooth admin permission yeah. for programmatic, like disable, enable. 
but it might, uh, it got a, uh, what do you want from your, what's your user expectation? You know, sometimes your user might be having headphones and listening to his favorite music. So yeah. it, it, usually we want to do a UX nicely thing to say, please, it's not working. Maybe you should buy a new device. Anywho, <laughs> moving on. Um, so you receive your results, you store in a map. Whenever you say, okay, I want to start open the door with the device that's closest to you. Kotlin makes beautiful, you get the values, filtered by some RSSI thresholds, ordered by the RSSI RSI is the received signal strength, uh, received signal intensity, and open this one, the first one on the list. So that should be a very straightforward code, but um, Due to those variants of devices, again, we, um, depending even like how you're holding the device, it's here or there, or the device was here and you're just passing behind when you, it, the, the, the scan, the, the, the electromagnetic wave come through your body, or for, there's some metal thing nearby, it has a crazy amount of variance though those value versus I can jump from like, it's, 20 meters away to one meter away and then back. It's nothing you can really reliably say you, you know, one centimeter from there. You tend, it's kind of more of a general area. Uh, so to work around that one, there's a little bit of math involved. It. Um, so there's this open source library. Um, someone at Sensorberg did it and and it, it's, it's just doing a nice average and you, you can base it on time. Uh, so if you get one scan and take quite a few seconds, take the next one, there's a whole nice way to deal with it. So if you're needing some fancy averaging, take a look. It's fully tested. Uh, and that threshold is another interesting one. If I just hard code on the code uh, minus 60 is going to be the, the limits or else you're just too far away. Some device is going to pick, some device not going to pick. So what we've ended up coding is uh, we start with some nice permissive defaults. Uh, and as the user, it's kind of a little machine learning thing. I don't even want to use this term, but <laughs> we are learning. It's on a machine. Uh, as it goes for every successful open, I pick up what's the value, we average it with the previous one, and with that you can actually see we have on some statistics, uh, the device uh, quite lowering the value, some of them stay quite up. To, that's especially to a, a block uh, opening the wrong door. Again, if you have two close by and I can my phone say I want to open this, it has to know. So with uh, this learning, what's the, the values for these specific devices is a great way of doing it. So now that we find which door we would like to open, we're gonna tell, please open it, and we saw the callbacks there. Um, <coughs> but there are the issues, right? Uh, connect only works from the UI threads, and your callbacks on Bluetooth, everything comes from a binder thread from a different process, so you're not on the UI thread, so you have to first work around it, ah, on some devices, not all of them. Uh, but that's easy, always throw to the UI thread. Um, sometimes disconnects. it disconnects, it's a peer-to-peer -peer low energy connection, it, it breaks, it happens. So then, what you do, just try again. So then you be increasing the time uh, uh, to open the door, which is bad. Um, same thing on all the callbacks. You have a status there that on the beginning I ignored that it might not be success. Why? Then a bit flipped, you know, there was someone received a phone call in, in, on the area and interrupt the transmission. Could be on the other end broken Bluetooth driver on the other device. So, so again, retry. Let's try catch, retry. Uh, ah, and there's the famous 133. If you Google a bit, you're going to find it. It's uh, is an internal GAT driver error, not documented. 
I mean, you can go into source code, it's there. It says got error, that, that's all you need. And again, you, you just retry, or quite, quite often the got error is just turning off and on again. Um, uh, what else do we got? Ah, yeah, the code handling of the GATS. So, uh, as you saw, it's uh, asynchronous callback. You start and then you receive connect and give the next function. And you really have to wait for the callback until you can issue the next uh, command. It, it, it's how it works. And I believe it would. It, it works nice for something like the Google Fit API of you have a UI showing in the user clicks and waits and returns. It's kind of a simple tool. Uh, do all the interactions, but on our case, uh, um, we want to just fire one after the other immediately as a result. Ideally, we want something synchronously. So we did a library for synchronous GAT execution, uh, which handles all the thread synchronization, send commands to the UI, blocks your current thread until it receives back, and, and, and then brings the result back to your own thread. So the code looks like this, uh, except a try-catch, because then you have timeout exception, disconnection ex exception. Um, and then at least makes more clear the code up to this point to work it. So this part, if I put a try catch in there, I can retry just this one step. Uh, it, it, it make more manageable from that callbacks going everywhere. Um, and still the same thing, discover service, uh, uh, subscribe for the cartridge. This one, descriptor and enable notify uh, you to subscribe for it, write, await for the message. This one is the actual code minus the try catching. So after much hacking with the API and the Bluetooth drivers and what you're gonna get is for scanning, use the Nordic Compat. Don't, don't even try to use the native ones. This one does a great job. And then you do a wrapper scanner on that to do start stop every once in a while, which once in a while will vary times per API level. Then you do a scanner NuGet wrapper to don't start and stop more than five times every 30 seconds. And that sometimes also depends on the user behavior. If they go out of the app and inside the app again, you're still going to be counting as start and stopping. Averaging your signal strength because they jump a lot. And if everything fails. And for the communication, it's just simpler to make it synchronously in a separate thread than try to handle all those callbacks. We try and fails, we try and disconnect, and if everything fails, turning off and on again. Uh, I think now it's back to Falco to some data analysis. Yeah, so you can kind of see there is a huge amount of things you need to be right, um, but then how do you identify all these devices? Um, we um, started to collect some data, uh, fully anonymous, and for instance, on the on the big chart, the, the the bar chart, the green part is the time that we spend to identify the device. So actually, one third of the time, roughly one third, is uh, wasted not even trying to connect to it. And then there is connecting, writing, waiting for the answer. Um, there is also uh, what we did with those 400,000 door openings. Uh, we collected the average time the phone took and then sorted by manufacturer, um, which is an interesting uh, uh, chart on its own. Uh, so interestingly, uh, Huawei is on the top of the, of the worst phones. And like um, only 20%, like 20 percent of the door openings take more than five seconds. So uh, that's quite, a, that's quite some, some number. And Google and Sony phones really turned out to be quite good in, in terms of Bluetooth stack. Um, so um, that's kind of what we, what we gathered. Now, how did we get there? Um, we first tried Firebase, but it definitely wasn't enough. Uh, it wasn't real time. And uh, the amount of filtering you could do there to pinpoint individual devices or individual device groups uh, uh, was, was very limited. Plus kind of running aggregations. Like we have this number, like how long did it took? end to end. Uh, there is no way, as far as we understood, to kind of send a number to Firebase and then look at the buckets, you know, how many people actually took under two seconds. So we built the buckets ourselves in the client code, totally disaster. And then again, 
you, you, you get a, a call from a customer, you got some ticket, you know, my phone is really slow. It's like, okay, then what, what, what phone do you have? Like, how, do we, how can we troubleshoot it? So you need something that's really, really uh, uh, fast, straightforward. Um, so we ended up using Elasticsearch, which is actually a great tool for, like, as a developer, you have, have some kind of this statistics and you want to get to it really fast and you don't want to uh, jump to, through th too many loops. So uh, Elasticsearch is really great. You can set up an account and uh, you have your own database within like two minutes if you have a credit card. And you just send your JSON uh, to the endpoint. Uh, there's very few things you need to know about. Um, you basically, you should do a index uh, per deployment. This is the index. So basically, this is really the, the URL. You have your own URL, then slash your index, and then you I don't know, call your object mobile statistics. Um, because there is no real server logic involved, you should be, uh, be a little careful about the integrity of the data. So don't just randomly change something that used to be a, a string to a number or something that was an object to a string. The database will reject your data. And then you have to delete everything and start all over again, which is an option, but you need to be aware. Um, and in general, because again, uh, Elasticsearch is made for like indexing strings and text, you don't want to send text that, is, uh, that contains spaces and, and casing could be relevant. So just lowercase everything, remove spaces, uh, like replace them with underscores, that's it. And uh, you also want to kind of add UUIDs or some identifiers uh, per device and user so you can aggregate and you can understand, okay, there's 20 users using a Galaxy A3 uh, and they have a huge average or they have uh, huge numbers in terms of uh, really trying to find the phone and then it might be a phone that is, is affected by the scanning bug. So you can really get down to the nitty gritty and, and really uh, get some good numbers. Of course, leave out any other personal data and once you're done with your debugging, you can also delete the, the, the buckets regularly. Um, so um, then there comes Kibana, which is kind of built into Elasticsearch, and you can build some really great like views. Uh, the ones you saw, basically screenshots. So like, yeah, give me a pie chart on my number, or give me a pie chart on my uh, on my users. Uh, how many users do I have? It's it's really easy, and just throw in these uh, values so you can kind of find out. Okay, I've got a new version now. Let's compare our new version with the bug fix to the version we've released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you can do that very easily with all the built-in uh, uh, data that kind of comes out of every app. Um, also, like we said in the title, um, to, to speed things up and also cover these sad people uh, with, with old uh, Bluetooth devices, there's ways to avoid Bluetooth, obviously. Um, and uh, what we did, we called this hybrid detection and hybrid communication. Um, like as a prototype last night, I added this uh, a QR code uh, detection. So we're using live demo. We can do a live demo in a second. Um, so in order to speed up the detection of the device, we're using Bluetooth. Like, ooh, I'm really close to this Bluetooth device. I should really connect to it. We're using yeah. NFC tags. So we write the MAC address onto the NFC tag to, to be able to connect to it. Uh, this optical thing is something we'll be trying out, but it probably has some downsides as well. And then we also detect, uh, we detect if somebody tapped the actual gateway. And then if you tap it, we know, well, you probably want to open something, and then we pick up the closest gateway, uh, and then we do our averaging, so we learn from the user by tapping, and, and then everything starts all over again. So you can work around Bluetooth downsides. If you, again, if you have a s uh, slow scanner, you can uh, be faster with NFC. And then by the end of kind of doing everything, you, you, you narrow down the devices that don't have a, a fast scanner and don't have NFC. So there's going to be a very, very little amount of, of uh, phones. And then also maybe you can add a button. And then people can just press a button. And then we kind of deterministically pick the closest device to connect to. So uh, we try to avoid it as much as possible, but you end up kind of having to put a button there. And then of course also when, in terms of communication, uh, everything that could go bad, uh, it's actually sometimes faster to take the whole server round trip. So connect to our server, server connects to the gateway, handshaking, open the door. So if you can, and that's what we're doing, we're, we're doing uh, HTTP calls via Wi-Fi or cellular, whatever you have. 
um, we'll be adding NFC for communication in the next version of the hardware, which will be interesting. So we're not going to only identify uh, who's, who we should connect to, but also exchange the data. And then uh, we basically want to offer all these communication options, and then winner takes it all. So whoever's fastest is going to open the door. You synchronize uh, these requests in the backend uh, on the device, and that's it. And we learned that you really need to do it. It really makes a difference, and you can narrow down these, these funny devices like that. All right. Um, a little early, but we can do the live demo. Uh, I'll, I'll keep this up. So kind of in this process of building all this, we, we open source some stuff. The synchronous gut, uh, you've seen like the actual code doing the, the connect, uh, connect, discover, write, uh, wait for answer uh, is going to be under that URL pretty soon. Uh, we did a talk about building an SDK where like all of this opening doors, communicating with your building is going to be as an SDK soon as well. And there is an old talk by me about uh, Bluetooth in general, uh, if, you, if you want to learn more about that. Um, so we can kind of look a little bit, do a little live, live demo. Um, so here you see, and I can make it auto refresh. Um, let's see, I actually have my phone. Ooh. So uh, you can see the little, actually there's a little camera on the bottom. So to, to speed up the process, there's literally now a camera running, trying to identify this QR code. Uh, and again, this is totally a prototype, but it triggers the opening of the door, and then connects via Bluetooth. Uh, the, the tap detection, I can just tap some stuff. It also starts uh, um, the thing. And then I should also be able to just hold very close uh, to start the communication. And here again, there's something going on. So uh, one of those cases, I turned off the, the HTTP communication now for this demo uh, to really fully show the the Bluetooth, uh, so now this one timed out. So this is where uh, HTTP call would have certainly helped. That's uh, when you received the 133 and, yeah. yeah. And we should uh, see, here is a, a one of the calls from just now. Uh, and like right away, I know um, we had an optical trigger. The searching of the device took no seconds. Um, and then writing our data, uh, we're actually writing quite amount some data. You have a limit of 20 bytes per write on Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, we fully encrypt our payload, so there's a little more, but it actually turned out not to be a, a problem at all. So you kind of see the times here, um, kind of spending uh, 0.2 seconds uh, on, on writing encrypted data is definitely worth the encryption and the added security. And then uh, the done. You can see there's definitely some variations. Two seconds, sometimes four seconds. Uh, that's kind of what you have to deal with and where you want to uh, be uh, on, on the lookout for, for optimizations. And um, in this kind of test environment, we have all kinds of data. So we have all the metrics like searching, connecting, writing, uh, how long did it take until we got an answer from the gateway. We are publishing these kind of machine learning values. So, so what's what does the phone think when it should open the door? Um, all these kinds of things we, we put in here. And then with, with Kibana and Elasticsearch, we can great, build some great, uh, um, uh, great some, create, create some great visualizations. Um, like this kind of stuff, you can kind of hack together pretty easily if, you, if you've got the data. And you can, of course, throw this at your, in your development area as a, as a motivation for your uh, engineers. Uh, and, and see very like with the super complex thing of like triggering, connecting, different ways of communicating. Uh, it's it's really easy to lose focus on on what went wrong, and this definitely helps uh, to identify it. All right, we're a little early, so we can do a little bit of Q and A. Um, yeah. If there are questions, both sides of the stage, or I can come to you and give me give you the microphone. Well, there's a First, question there. Second part. Okay. Hi. Um, can you shed some light uh, on how you uh, actually authenticate uh, the Android phone? Uh, so what I'm asking uh, is, uh, 
what is the way to actually open the door with a, uh, with a specific phone only. So it will be like my door and my phone, not like the other guy phone, yeah. which but can open, still can open my door. So, so we have a permission system behind it. So you, uh, you, we have groups, and like you can put yourself in a group to be accessible to the door. And then um, right now the server basically verifies that you can now open the door, or you have a booking for a room. And then it's basically re request response via Bluetooth, and then this device executes the. So we have you can connect the door here on this side, which is attached to the wall, and then it just opens. So, so the the code samples open door door open. That was just a sample. Yeah. The, this is connected to the cloud. The server have full like, control. The actual message has like user ID and your device, and there's the whole permission system to. This thing only really opens the door after the server said it's OK to, to open. Or you can add some like key encrypted. You send an encrypted message, and then the gateway verifies your key, knows your key is authorized for the door, and will open, or like do the, do the, connect the contacts or provide power to the electrical strike. So that's kind of your business logic to decide when to open door. Understood. Thank you. Was someone else? All right. Uh, see you. Uh, so uh, I am using this product on daily basis Great. to open doors. Thank you. Uh, I, I came a bit late to the presentation, but my question I want to understand in the last like 10 seconds, what, what are the steps from getting the phone closer to the sensor till the door opens or fails? Where, 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 where is the pain points? And like just in 10 seconds, what are the steps and wh yeah. what fails? Or Definitely watch the talk afterwards, but it's, yeah. it's a combination of having funny devices, lots of variation, and then the challenge is to connect, to find, and then everything could break in those steps. Uh, you should definitely watch the slides because yeah. the whole Bluetooth communication has lots of pitfalls. Yeah, as cool as it is the Bluetooth itself, it is a low energy peer-to-peer -peer communication. And a peer-to-peer -peer communication is always worse than a structured one, and a low energy is always going to you know, suffer from disconnections, message errors, and step of stuff. So there are quite a few pain points down these slides, for sure we broke it down more, so yeah. Uh, uh, last point, uh, is there any new version of the app? that will make it a bit faster? or We're, we're constantly uh, improving the app. So uh. the, the optical one is on the Alpha Play Store, but I don't think I'll push it with the little uh, like camera view in it. So yeah. no, we were constantly improving. Yeah, thanks. Hey, thank you for the talk, and thank you for sharing. A, a bit closer, okay. please. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you for the talking. Thank you for sharing the pain of working with BLE. Do you ever worked on automating the test for BLA, connecting BLA, BLA with so, devices? Sorry, I missed the piece of the... Automating. Huh? Automating, automating the, the connect. Um, with different um, devices and making sure that when you do any change to your code, it's still working on all devices. Uh, you you want to share something? You, you talk. I, well, I show on the actual to... Bluetooth layer itself, uh, you... Uh, there's the open device form, so then you have to set up a little server, connect actual devices, because you're not going to test a, a hardware feature with, uh, without the actual hardware there. You cannot just run on a JVM and say, ah, hey, I, because you want to seize those pain points. So uh, one definitely, I says to check it out, the device test form. So you can set up in a computer, connect several devices, and then you do your normal UI automation type of test with a gateway next to it and next to connect. There is this funny little prototype. Uh, it's Falco. not a prototype. Yeah. Sorry, that's this <laughs> funny little test rig Falco puts together. And, and we actually, there's the whole thing running in there on the real thing. Yeah. And we get in the, uh, the statistics for this device. We run for several different devices as well. We can get like timings and, and how often the radio fail, all this type of information. So you want to automate the actual thing. So we took Lego train uh, and put a, a device so that it kind of slides next to it. And then we literally let it run. And, and, and like, for instance, at Factory, where the previous question was asked, 
uh, like if there was a person with a funny device, we put it there, we use the statistics to kind of analyze, okay, what's going on here? Uh, and you can, it's, it's actually quite scientific. You can vary the speed of the train. So if you make it really slow, that's one parameter. Uh, if you make it really fast, some devices don't even pick it up. So it's, it's actually quite sophisticated. Um, but you really, like, it's Bluetooth, so you kind of have to really do the, the, the real deal. Yeah, you have to really run on devices yeah. with, with the gateway sitting next to the device. To we have yet to automate this into the build pipeline, but it's on the list. So eventually, we'll have a new build, and uh, the train will go. Actually, the gateway will power the train, because the train runs on 9 volts. We have this much of power. So you literally have to do that. But from a QA perspective, manually, you can have some great results automating it. It's really hard to kind of like find a repeatable uh, um, action that you can test on. That's why we, we thought having a Lego, Lego train. Our CEO wanted to buy one of those mechanical arms that picks up a phone, you know? But uh, Lego train, definitely cheaper and uh, equally impressive. Other Thank questions? You. Uh, if the there are still an answer question, I think they will be happy to answer it downstage because we still okay. have to prepare for the next talk. But awesome. thank you again for your presentation. It was really interesting. Make another applause for them. They were really good. Thank you. And see you at the next talk.